So this is a clutch that I made, and I wanted to share it in case um, somebody else who's watching this video has to make something similar and needs a little bit of inspiration for their design. So this is a dog clutch. Um, that means that it's, it's either fully on or it's fully off, um, and it, it does not slip like a friction clutch. It is a dog clutch. So what this clutch is designed to do is it has an input sprocket and it has an output sprocket and when it's on it locks these two sprockets together just as if they were mounted permanently to the same shaft and when it's off the two sprockets can spin independently of each other um, so that's basically just what any clutch is designed to do and that's what this one does so um, I'm going to give a brief overview of how it works and I didn't bring any tools home so I can't take it apart unfortunately it's just gonna have to stay together as it is uh, but I'll do my best to describe it and hopefully that that conveys the idea well enough so um, the first part of the clutch is the main shaft and basically there's a solid shaft that runs the entire length of this and that shaft you can see it it's right there it's that um, this this here the splined portion and then you can just barely see a little bit of it back there too. Those are all parts of the main shaft. And of course it runs through this middle section that you can't see it and, and behind this area too. And the main shaft is rigidly connected to this. It's, it's actually welded to this input sprocket. So then the power comes on a chain, obviously from an engine or something to this input sprocket. And it's transmitted along this main shaft down these splines here. And this part here, which I will call it um, the selector, how about that? I'll call it the selector. It is splined to the shaft. So this is not able to rotate independently, but it can slide relative to the shaft. It just can't rotate against it. So then the power is then um, basically now in the selector and then when the selector engages well i guess i'll, I'll note that uh as you can see this this moves independently because it's just on a bronze bushing um so it it has no ability to to uh transmit torque until the selector engages its teeth like so and now the power can go in through the sprocket down the main shaft through these splines, through the selector, and to the output um, dogs and to the output sprocket. So that's the power flow of this system. And now I'll just um, talk about a few minor design points that might be good to keep in mind um, for anyone who's building something like this. So first of all, since this sprocket here is the output, it doesn't actually spin or sorry, no, it doesn't actually spin relative to the main shaft when the clutch is engaged. You can see it's, it's almost as if it was just rigidly connected to the main shaft. There's no relative motion at all. So this bearing, when this clutch is under load, this bearing doesn't actually spin at all. And that means you actually don't have to use a very heavy duty bearing um, in order to handle these kinds of loads, which is why you can just get away with a bronze bushing that doesn't even really have any source of lubrication other than its internal oil pores. Um, and of course, when you disengage the clutch, then it spins, and the, the speed can be quite high in that case, but there's no load. Um, so again, uh, a very low grade bearing is quite sufficient. Um, otherwise, a ball bearing would be needed, but, um, uh, well, I mean, a bronze bushing could be used too, but you'd probably want um, some kind of a forced lubrication if you're going to use bronze bushing under um, like medium load and high surface speeds. Uh, but this has either high surface speed and no load or high load and zero surface speed. So, so really it's a, a great choice for this. And it's also very low profile. It's only about an eighth of an inch thick. It's a, I think it's actually a sixteenth of an inch thick. Either way, it's, it's very thin. So then um, on the other hand, we have a bearing on this part because the selector obviously is rotating with the shaft and in order to actuate it, you need something, some way to hold on to it that's not rotating. And that's what this portion does here. 
Um, this is a just kind of a yoke or whatever that um, a lever can, you know, a lever with like some holes bored in it can kind of hang onto it like that and you know you can actuate it in whatever way is convenient then. So I had to put a bearing in that um, just because a, a ball bearing is really the most convenient way to, to handle these kinds of loads without causing all kinds of issues because really it has to uh, handle the the radial load of course which is very light but just just to make sure this thing doesn't rub on anything it needs to have a bearing there and then the more significant load is the axial load because when this thing engages like that you have to push on it to get it to go in it doesn't just slide in like that because there might actually be a little bit of torque on this when you're starting to engage it so you have to push on it to get it in so you can see that's that's how I retained the bearing there is a snap ring on the selector body and then the bearing sits in a bore it's bored in this aluminum part and it has a retainer plate um, there wasn't enough room to put an internal snap ring in there so I had to use this retaining plate method in order to hold that bearing in there nice and tight um, or you could just rely on a press fit but that would be kind of sketchy so um, yeah that's that's that note and um, yeah I guess I'll I'll address one more thing. It, it, it's kind of misleading in the video. It looks like this part, this um, part in there, this, right? It looks like this is part of this, but it's actually not. Um, this is just a ring in there. It's just a spacer ring. And it, it um, basically, there's a snap ring right here. You can just barely see that black line. That's a snap ring. This spacer ring goes in next, and then that spacer ring bears up against this um, this whole assembly, this whole part right there, just to make sure this whole thing stays put axially, so that way it can't slide this way. Because this one we want to be able to slide, but this one needs to stay put, so you, I can't slide that. Um, and you can see, um, well, you can just barely see it, yeah. This part is really just a simple lathe part um, before anyway these before these like triangles are cut out of it it's just a round part with a hole board in it and this one was the same as that too um, except for this one has that spacer in there so I didn't like somehow mill this super sharp corner in there with some magic machining method that's that's not how I did it at all it's it's quite simple yeah and the splines I also uh, machined uh, on a normal Bridgeport mill as well and the way I did that was just by using a dividing head and basically these are straight sided splines just like a tractor PTO shaft um, and so I had a dividing head set up to index this shaft in six positions it's a six tooth spline and then I had an end mill and I milled on one side of the tooth and then I switched it offset at the other side milled the other side of the tooth and then I would index it do the same here mill one side of the tooth mill the other side of the tooth and then that would leave these like triangle peaks in the middle. And so I just took a, a flat cut and flattened out those peaks in the middle to make clearance. And then the internal spline you can also do on a bridge port. And um, the way to do that is you have to broach it. So um, it's rather than me explain that, I'll just refer you to some videos. Just look up using the bridge port slotting head to broach a keyway. It's just like broaching a keyway, except you need to broach six keyways equally spaced so that um, they match up to the splines. So just look that up if you've never seen that before. Yeah, and then the, the final thing I didn't show, but these uh, aluminum pins or whatever they look like they are, they, they have these plastic bushings that go on them um, just to prevent them from wearing out due to the, the vibrations and the actual forces that will be applied to this. So that is all for the video. I hope it was helpful to anyone who is making something like this. Um, let me know if there's any questions and I'll, I'll do my best to, to explain anything that wasn't clear. Thanks for watching.